Welcome to another episode of the Understanding Crypto series by Thomas Plunkett. We're going to take a look at an Ethereum Web3 decentralized application auction example to demonstrate some of the decentralized application concepts we've been talking about. Um, this video and the slides are available in our Creative Commons license. Um, well, so let's talk about this. Um, we're talking about an auction dApp. The uh, auction dApp is really here just to demonstrate how these different decentralization tools can work. So in this particular case, our auction dApp is going to allow a user to register on a non-fungible token representing a deed to some unique asset, perhaps a house, a car, trade mag, trademark, some artwork, whatever. doesn't matter. Um, you know, your non-fungible token under the ERC-721 can represent any of those things. So once our non-fungible token has been registered, the ownership of the token is transferred to the auction DAP, where it's allowed to be listed for sale. The auction DAP then lists each of the registered NFTs, allowing others to place bids. During each auction, the users can join a chat room created specifically for that NFT auction. Once the NFT auction is finalized, uh, the token ownership is transferred to the winner of the auction. So here is a little diagram showing us our auction process. We've got um, a number of different components in here. You can see we've got a smart contract that implements uh, the ERC-721 token uh, down at the bottom. That's our ERC-721 token. We've got our smart contract implementing the auction. That's the smart contract in the middle of the diagram. Um, you know, we label that the auction house smart contract. Uh, we've got a web front end using a JavaScript framework. Uh, we've got a uh, web three JavaScript library to connect to Ethereum uh, via MetaMask and so on. Uh, and we're also going to be using a couple of the uh, Ethereum decentralized app components we'll talk about later. Uh, you know, we'll use a swarm client to store uh, the images and so forth, those sort of resources. And we'll use a whisper client for messaging in our chat room between the participants. Uh, And so you can see, looking at the diagram, what the process is going to be. You know, basically, the token is assigned to the, the auction house contract, so it can be auctioned off. We've got the auction creator who is actually, you know, creating the auction. Um, and then you have a buyer who will bid on. It, and if the buyer actually wins, they'll actually receive the asset uh, in exchange for their ether. And if the... Uh, auction gets canceled and the buyer gets their ether back or if the buyer loses the auction they get their ether back and so on so we talked about the main components of the auction dap uh the smart the two smart contracts the javascript uh frameworks we're working with as well as our decentralized storage, which we're going to use Swarm in this case, although IPFS would also work, and Whisper for some uh, chat rooms. All right, so let's talk about these smart contracts in a little bit greater detail. So our auction decentralized application is supported by two smart contracts that need to be deployed on the Ethereum blockchain for our application to work. Uh, we've got our auction repository smart contract, uh, which is going to be uh, in our deed repository smart contract. Uh, we'll start by taking a look at the deed repository contract, um, which is, you know, basically a repository for storing ERC-721 tokens, non-fungible tokens that are being used in the auction. Uh, but the auction itself is being run by the auction repository contract. So the deed repository contract is really just an ERC-721 contract for your non-fungible tokens. The auction repository is what's actually running the auction. So the smart contract is actually too long to show it on a slide, but I'll show the main definition of the contract and the data structures in the slides. And I'll also put a link to the contract in the uh, YouTube description for this video. So here's a look at the deed repository smart contract. 
Now, this contract is an e you know, has the is keyword followed by ERC 721 token. That's showing you, hey, we're implementing the ERC 721 token interface. Uh, and that's what you want to do if you want to create a non fungible token contract, is you're supposed to implement that interface. Um, and of course, we have to import the ERC 721 token dot solidity interface in order to do that. Um, so basically, again, this is a, a basic non fungible token, pretty standard. We got the basic uh, mappings, the basic uh, data, uh, data structure uh, to allow us to bid on it uh, and so on. Um, so it's basically just following the, the normal um, ERC721 aspects that need to be there. All right, so you've got functions to register a new token, you've got functions to add metadata to a token, and then you've got a function that tells you that the deed metadata was in fact added to the repository, true or false. So let's take a look at our auction repository smart contract. This is the one that's actually running the auction. You know, the, that ERC721 contract we just saw is pretty standard non-fungible token. So here we've got a, a, an array that has the various auctions. We've got a mapping from the auction index to the user bids in the next line. And you've got a mapping from the owner of the NFT to, a, I'm sorry, the owner of the auction to a list of owned auctions. Um, then you've got a data structure to hold the bidder in the amount and an auction data structure, which holds all the various required info for that particular auction, the name, the, the block deeds, metadata, deed IDs, owners, and so on. Um, some of the other functions include, and there's a lot of them here, so I'm not showing you all the details, but we've got functions like get count, get the bids count, get auctions of, get current bid, get auctions count by of owner, auction by ID, create auction, approve and transfer, cancel auction, finalize auction, and so on. Uh, so that's a lot of different uh, functions. Um, hold on a second. And you can deploy these uh, contracts to the Ethereum blockchain of your choice, whether you're using a test network like Robston, uh, you know, and so on. So let's take a look at um, how we're going to govern our decentralized application. If you read through the two smart contracts, the auction DAP, you'll notice that there's no special account or role that has special privileges over the DAP. Each auction has an owner with special capabilities, but the auction DAP itself doesn't have a privileged user. And so this is actually a deliberate choice based on the idea that not having a privileged user gives you increased decentralization. You know, once you create it, you've relinquished control and it just exists out there. Uh, on the other hand, some dApps uh, have one or more privileged accounts with special capabilities, such as the ability to terminate the contract or to override or change its configuration or to veto certain operations. Uh, usually these governance fo functions are created into a DAP in order to avoid unknown problems that might arise due to a bug. For example, you know, in one of my earlier lectures, I talked about the DAO hack. Well, if the DAO had had special governance functions, uh, they might have been able to shut down the DAO contract uh, before too much money had been stolen. The issue of governance is a particularly difficult one to solve as it represents a double-edged sword. On the one side, privileged accounts are dangerous. If a privileged account is compromised, then that person, now, the hacker now has access uh, to the DAP. On the other hand, without a privileged account, there's no recovery options if a bug is found, uh, and other than to maybe have a white hat hacker themselves hack the, the, uh, the contract. Uh, and we've seen both of these risks happen in, in uh, previous examples in, that I've covered in other earlier lectures. In the case of the DAO, uh, there were some privileged accounts called curators, but they were so limited in their capabilities, they couldn't do anything to stop the hack. Uh, and they couldn't prevent the DAO attacker withdrawing funds. Uh, another example is the decentralized exchange Bancor that experienced a massive theft because a privileged management account was compromised. So even though they created that privileged account, then that resulted in the privileged account being able to steal the money. And those people who thought Bancor was more decentralized learned out the heart, turned out, 
learned the hard way that Bancor was not. So when building a DAP, you have to decide if you want to make the smart contracts truly impendent, you know, launching them and then having no control or creating privileged accounts and running the risk of the privileged accounts being a weak point. Either choice has risk. In the long run, DAPs uh, that have specialized access for privileged accounts are not going to be treated as decentralized. But again, decentralization is a continuum. It's not a Boolean yes or no, but it's a question of just how much decentralization you have. So let's talk about the front end user interface for our auction DAP. Once the auction DAP's contracts are deployed, you can interact with them using your favorite JavaScript console and web three JS or another web three library. Uh, however, most users are gonna need an easy to use interface. So in this example, we're going to use uh, our auction DAP user interface is built using the Vue 2 Vuetify JavaScript framework. Uh, and you can find the user interface code in the links that I'll put up uh, in the video uh, description. So here's a look at the folder structure and contents for our, our once we've done our deployment. Uh, and so once you deploy the, the contracts, you want to edit the front end configuration in uh, and enter the addresses, the deed repository and the auction repository contracts. The front end application also needs access to an Ethereum node offering a JSON RPC and WebSockets interface. So once you've configured that front end, you then launch it with a web server using commands like the ones I show here where I do NPM install and NPM run dev. And then our auction DAP front end will launch and be accessible via web browser um, using the localhost address with the port number 8080. So if all goes well, you should see this screen showing your auction DAP UI, which illustrates the auction DAP running in a web browser. So we've got a web browser interface and we're showing the auction DAP uh, with, uh, you know, right now we just see recent auctions. You don't see any specific recent, recent auctions there. So our DAP is already decentralized to a certain extent. You know, we've got smart contracts, we've got um, our JavaScript front end, but there's some other things we can do to even increase the decentralization. You know, currently our auction repository contract operates independently of any oversight. It's open to everyone. You know, we don't have a special privileged account on it. Once deployed, it can't be stopped, nor can any auction be controlled. It's just out there on the blockchain. Each auction will have a separate chat room that allows anyone to communicate with the auction without censorship or identification. The various auction acts, assets such as description and images are stored on Swarm, making them hard to censor a block. Anyone can interact with the decentralized app by constructing transactions manually or by running the view front end on their local machine. The DAP code itself is open source and developed in a public repository. So there are two things we can do to make it further decentralized and resilient. We can store all the app code and swarm or interplanetary file system IPFS, and we can access the DAP by reference to a name using the Ethereum name service. So we're going to do some subsequent lectures where I'll dive into Swarm and I'll dive into ENS. So for now, though, I want to thank you for watching this uh, brief little lecture on Web3 Auction DAP.